Are you looking for ways to strengthen your marriage? Would you like to raise children you enjoy being around? Do you long for a peaceful, orderly home that's a blessing to everyone who comes through its doors? Then you've come to the right place. I'm Jennifer Flanders, a Bible-believing, homeschooling mother to 12 and host of the Loving Life at Home podcast. Join me as we discover what God's Word has to say about marriage, motherhood, and minding the things that matter most. Hello, friend. Welcome to episode 57 of Loving Life at Home. This week, we are talking all about children's chores. I've been fielding a lot of questions on this topic lately, and I realize I haven't shared much about how we handle chores in our house, so today is the day. Kids will be heading back to school soon, or if you homeschool like I do, perhaps they'll be gathering for lessons around the kitchen table or hitting the books while lounging on couches and easy chairs in the house or on blankets spread under trees in the backyard. Either way, I hope that you'll recognize household chores as a valuable part of their life skills education. The fact is, few things do more for a child's sense of confidence and responsibility than learning to do household chores thoroughly, consistently, cheerfully, and without being reminded. Our kids all realize that their contribution to family life is important. They know that we depend on them to help keep our home looking good and running smoothly, and they've learned to work hard, usually without complaining. This work ethic will serve them well when they're grown. For our family, we've grouped all chores into one of three categories. First is personal chores. Those are the things that children do each day to keep their personal things in order, like making their beds, and straightening their rooms, or folding and putting away their clean laundry. The children have never gotten paid for doing such things, nor do we give them allowance. They're simply expected to do them consistently and cheerfully in gratitude for the privilege of living at home and to make sure it remains a tidy and pleasant place to live. When the kids were all really young, we'd usually partner a preschooler with an older sibling who would help make certain the little one's beds got made and their clothes put away satisfactorily. And while we're on the topic, we made those chores just as easy as we could. I already talked about how we dealt with toys in episode 53 when we discussed microsystems for home management, but I don't think I addressed bed making at that time. When our kids were little, we used just a fitted sheet and one top layer, either a quilt or a covered blanket or a comforter, something like that. So making the bed only entailed flapping that top layer out over the mattress and smoothing it down, and then placing the pillow back at the head of the bed. It could literally be accomplished in about 20 seconds. So even if they were helping a toddler sibling, both beds would look perfect in no more than a minute. They like this method so much that most of them have kept that routine even as older teens and adults. In fact, the red cotton quilts that my older boys have been sleeping under for years now got so threadbare that I recently replaced them. And when I got online to order new sheets to match, I asked if they wanted to have top sheets or extra blankets now that they're older and they might find a fully made bed a little bit more comfortable. But they all said no. They like the system that they're used to and they just wanted the quilt and the bottom sheet. So although ordered sheet sets that included the top sheets, I'm planning to just cut up at least one of those top sheets to make extra pillowcases since all of those, all three of those boys take after their dad and they sleep with about three or four pillows each. And the sets only came with one pillowcase. So to have matching ones, I'm going to cut one up and make new pillowcases out of that. Now, when it comes to clothes, I don't care if they hang their clothes up in the closets or fold them and put them neatly into drawers. As long as the dirty clothes are deposited in the hamper and the clothes in their rooms are clean, sorted, and out of sight, I don't try to micromanage how they handle putting their clothes away. In my own closet... All the hangers point in the same direction and all the clothes are organized by color and style. And in my drawers and my husband's drawers, we fold and file our t-shirts and underwear, rotating them from front to back or left to right as we wear them. But I quickly realized when my kids were younger that any effort I put into organizing their drawers in similar fashion was misspent and it would be undone in a matter of minutes the first time they changed clothes in the recently restocked closet. I definitely do have some kids who file their folded clothes and organize everything in rainbow order and are very meticulous about keeping their laundry just so, but that really has to come from the inside. 
So I don't try to force it on everyone. I just enjoy it in my room and enjoy the fact that my husband likes it that way too. But uh, as long as the kids' stuff is out of sight and put away in some fashion, then I'm okay with that. The only thing that when it comes to laundry that we're a little bit OCD about is our stance on never stashing dirty clothes in our laundry room. We bring baskets of dirty laundry in one at a time and put them directly into the washer. And if there's more dirty clothes than will fit into the the washer in one load, then we keep the rest of them outside the door of the utility room or the laundry room, never inside. That way, the entire family knows that any clothes that you find in the basket inside the laundry room are clean and waiting to be put away. We recently had to explain that family rule to my grandkids, though, because I've been homeschooling three of them, and sometimes they'll go running or swimming or take a shower at our house after getting sweaty shooting baskets, and we started finding wet towels in the corner of the laundry room and realized that they were changing clothes in there and unwittingly leaving their dirty things behind. Thankfully, they dropped them in the corner so they weren't yet getting mixed in with everything else. But we told them to scoop them up and deposit them in the laundry basket right outside the door of the laundry room instead so that they won't accidentally get mixed up with the clean clothes. The last thing I'll say about keeping laundry put away in bedrooms tidy is that I did create a little checklist to help my kids know what I mean when I tell them to clean up their room. I call it my my bedroom inspection chart, and I'll link a free printable version in today's show notes. But that's enough about personal chores. The next category of children's chore is daily chores. Those are the things that have to be done daily or even several times a day, like washing clothes and wiping down counters, sweeping floors and the kitchen after we eat, gathering trash, loading the dishwasher, or cooking meals. Those are the things that benefit the entire family, and we don't pay our children for doing that kind of chore either. Every child from about three years old and up is assigned one daily task to do before or after every meal. And we only rotate those chores annually. So each child will do their assigned chore every day for a year, usually several times a day. New assignments are made in January according to the child's maturity and ability. We do consult them to see what their preference is for the next year's chore, but we do want them to rotate through all the chores. Younger children get the job of setting the table or sorting clean silverware, something that's relatively easy for them to do. Middle kids get to clear the table and load the dishwasher, help with meal prep or gather and take out trash. And then the older kids get jobs like sweeping up after the meals or wiping down the tabletops and counters or sorting and doing laundry before or after we sit down to eat. Our yearly rotation serves several purposes. First, it makes it easier to tailor assigned chores to each child's age and capabilities. Second, it eliminates all arguments along the lines of, I did that chore yesterday, today it's your turn. I don't want to hear that. And third, it allows the child to become very proficient in one area before moving on to another. When they have to do the same chore over and over and over again, three times a day, they get really fast at it and really good at it before they get the new chore. So it it really encourages mastery. And four, it ensures that by the time each child is grown and ready to leave home, he or she will have rotated through and become comfortable doing all the tasks associated with keeping a house, cooking, cleaning, laundry, etc. Of course, there are many other options for rotating chore assignments. One reason the yearly shuffle works for us is that we have so many kids. Each one could have a single job. In smaller families, each family member will have more jobs to do, though each individual chore should take less time because it's faster to load three plates, cups, and forks into the dishwasher than 15 of each. The system worked well for us for more than three decades. Kids stayed on the rotation until they started college, which may account for why so many of mine have started college classes early. They were incentivized by the knowledge that they wouldn't have to load the dishwasher or sweep the floor three times a day once they started spending most of the day on campus. Of course, now that I'm down to just one child, a 14-year-old daughter who isn't in college or grown up and moved away from home, we ended up setting aside our yearly chore rotation schedule about a year ago. The nice thing is all our kids are competent and capable of doing all the things that need to be done around the house. And when they're home, they all pitch in without even being asked. They wash laundry or fold clothes, cook meals for the whole family even. They wash dishes, they wipe down counters and all the rest without my even having to ask other than to provide a little direction when they come in and volunteer, what can I do to help? And 
when none of them are around, then there's not so much mess to clean up. Abby and I might have two plates and two cups to put in the dishwasher before heading back to our schoolwork, so that's pretty easy. And on days that grandkids are here schooling with us, they pitch in with the chores as well, although they've devised a new way to determine who does what. They usually play knockout, and the winner gets first choice in deciding which chore to do, and then it goes on down from there, depending on when you got knocked out. And they all get a little exercise that way, and they get to help in deciding what they do, and they get to practice some good sportsmanship as well. So we've discussed personal chores and daily chores, all of which are done without compensation other than the knowledge and the satisfaction that comes from knowing that you're doing your share to help keep the family home running smoothly as a needed and valued member of the household. And of course, gaining skills that you'll need to oversee your own home someday and make it a clean and warm and inviting place to be as well. Then the last category of chores that our children do are paid chores. These are those bigger tasks that we normally do less frequently, things that we might hire somebody else to do, like deep cleaning the house or mowing the lawn. We do some of those paid chores once every week or two, like dusting the furniture, mopping the floor, scrubbing bathrooms, mowing the lawn. Others are seasonal, like pruning trees or washing windows, weeding or mulching flower beds, splitting wood, hanging outdoor lights on the house at Christmas time, things like that. These are big jobs historically done by our older children. They do great work and we pay them for it and we pay them well, knowing that the more they earn, the more they save for college since they're only allowed to spend half of what they earn. The rest is split between savings, 40%. And giving 10%, either to the church or missions or some other charitable cause of their own choosing. That prepares them for the real world where a big portion of their paycheck will go to pay taxes and social security and such. For younger kids who are interested in earning money, I find other jobs that need to be done less frequently, like cleaning baseboards or raking leaves or washing cars. If you need more ideas for the kinds of chores kids can do, I made a pretty little free printable chart several years ago, which I entitled Age Appropriate Chores for Children. And I'll link it in today's show notes. It was so popular when I first published it that our whole website broke from all the traffic it generated. A Montessori Facebook page reposted it and a couple of major newspapers referenced it as well in articles or editorials. I don't remember for sure which ones. I'm thinking it was the New York Times and maybe Huffington Post or maybe USA Today. But it caused our traffic to spike and sent us well over 100 to 150,000 visitors in a matter of hours after each article was posted. And that's despite the fact that most of those mentions didn't even include a link to our website. I'm assuming that the readers must have just seen the URL that I embedded in the pretty little printable I made and looked us up that way. It gained traction in other countries as well and was even translated into Spanish and German and French and Italian. You can download copies of those translations as well as the English one through that same link that I we'll put on the show notes. Of course, as is the case with anything that attracts a lot of attention, people were very polarized in their reaction to my little children's chore chart. Some people thought it was terrible, horrible, no good, and very bad that I expected my kids to make their beds and tidy their room and clear their dishes from the dinner table. And they told me so in no uncertain terms. Making your children into your personal slaves does not make them better people or more productive humans, one reader wrote. Another suggested, this list is a bit overboard. Try birth control. I suspect that some of the objections I received may have come from kids rather than adults. Maybe even the kids who didn't like the fact their parents had printed off my list and were now requiring them to pitch in. One boy named Alexander got right to the point. This list is bull crap, he told me. I conceded that he might be right, but as every good gardener knows... Cow manure is just the thing for helping young plants grow big and strong, and doing regular chores has the same effect on children. Several readers told me I was stealing my children's childhoods by making them do chores, and one even suggested that the only reason I even had so many kids in the first place is so that I would have that much more free labor which is so laughable. I can only guess the person who made the accusation has absolutely no appreciation of the law of cause and effect and probably has no children either. 
Because if my highest goal were really to just sit around all day with my feet up, then giving birth to 12 babies and spending more than 18 years housing and clothing and teaching and training each of them would be a wildly inefficient way to accomplish that dream. As Proverbs 14.4 tells us, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but from the strength of an ox come abundant harvests. And the same is true with children in a home. Where there are no children, the home stays much cleaner. Children make more messes than they clean up, at least in the early years. So having lots of children to have more free labor does not make sense. That would be very short-sighted indeed. Fortunately, those negative comments were in the minority. I had lots of readers who thought my children's chore chart was the best thing since sliced bread. That's what's wrong with today's youth, they insisted. They aren't required to do any meaningful work. Many parents understand instinctively that doing chores is good for children and for the family as a whole. We do our kids no favors when we attend to all the chores ourselves while our children play. Chores teach life skills, they build confidence, they contribute to family living, and they prepare our kids for eventual independence. Plus, when a child gains competence and experience in one area, it often improves his performance and willingness to try in other areas as well. These are all good things, and several readers noted even more positive effects of incorporating our children's help with household duties, including the fact that chores give kids a sense of belonging and of being part of a team. They teach responsibility and independence and time management skills. They give children the joy of doing a good job of helping others and making the world a better place. They combat laziness and self-centeredness and feelings of entitlement. They turn children into good, productive, hardworking citizens and make kids feel important in family structure. Chores give kids an opportunity to learn through participation and children gain confidence by mastering new skills, especially skills that they perceive as grown up. Chores also give kids hands-on job training for life. They serve to instill a strong work ethic, Kids are more capable than a lot of people think. They can be competent and they can do tasks well. We should teach them that while they're young. They aren't going to magically learn it all when they grow up. Some readers told me how grateful they were that their own parents taught them the value of hard work or that they had raised their children in a similar way and are now so blessed to see their children thriving as adults. And that last point is a recurrent theme. When researchers studied highly successful people, they found that the two things most of them had in common were that they ate meals as a family and they were required to do chores while growing up. I don't remember where I first saw that research, but I know Harvard has done a similar 75-year longitudinal study which demonstrated a clear link between doing chores as a child and becoming a happier, more successful adult. Plus, it's good for children's psychological well-being to do meaningful work and to know that their help is needed and their contributions are appreciated and that they're valued members of the family and of the team. And the earlier we start all of that, the better. So what was on this polarizing list of children's chores? I'm not going to read the entire list, but here's a sampling to show you what kids are capable of. Naturally, every child is different, and this is not meant to be a benchmark listing or some sort of competency test. But all things being considered, the majority of kids, including all 12 of my own, are able to do some very basic things, even at very young ages. For instance, by age two or three, Most kids can learn to put toys in a toy box or stack books on a shelf or throw trash in a trash can. And they can also place dirty clothes in the laundry hamper, preferably just as soon as they peel them off their bodies. Often singing a little song will motivate them to pitch in when it's time to put up the toys or the books or tidy the house. Like, clean up, clean up, everybody everywhere. Clean up, clean up, everybody do your share. I think that may have been a Barney song. Do you remember that purple dinosaur? I never watched Barney, so I'm not sure, but I think that's where that particular song originated. Another is, who can help pick up the toys? I can help. I can help. Who can help pick up the toys? I can be a helper. I think that's the one my mom used to sing with me. I used to sing it to my children, and I'd use their names when I did. Who can help pick up the toys? Jonathan, yes, he can. Or Bethany, yes, siree. Or David can, he's the man. Who can help pick up the toys? David is a helper. 
Then, by age four or five, children can learn to feed pets, especially if you'll provide a measuring cup for dry food to keep the serving size consistent, or they can make their beds, as we discussed earlier, or sort clean silverware. You can put away the sharp knives yourself and let them do the rest, or even prepare simple snacks like cheese and crackers, or they can rinse and destem grapes, or make peanut butter toast. Ages six and seven can carry a bag through the house and gather the trash from every room. Not that the trash is scattered all over every room, but you have smaller trash cans throughout the house near desks and in bathrooms. You know what I mean. They can also learn to fold towels. Just teach them how to line up the edges to make a neat stack. And they can dust mop floors. If you'll attach a telescoping handle so it's just their size, it will be perfect. And empty the dishwasher. You might want to invest in shatterproof plates and drinkware for that age, but... They are fully capable of doing that. By eight or nine, they can load the dishwasher or wash laundry, even bake cookies and wipe off the table. Just teach them how to do that task without wiping crumbs onto the floor. As far as the baking cookies go, our kids usually started with the three ingredient peanut butter cookies. I'll link it in the show notes, but it's easy to remember one cup of peanut butter, one cup of sugar, and one egg. And you cook it, I think it 400 for 11 minutes, something like that, after you mix it and roll it in balls and flatten it with a fork. Then age 10 through 11 can clean bathrooms, vacuum rugs, prepare simple meals, mow the lawn, Ages 12 and up can mop the house, trim the hedges, and with proper instructions, even do simple household repairs like fixing leaky pipes or loose doorknobs or broken hinges, etc. I had one son replace a garbage disposal for me and did such a great job. He did a better job than the people that originally installed the one that broke. And my daughter just fixed a doorknob not too long ago and replaced the batteries in the computerized lock that's on the door. And she also rewired a lamp in her room that had a faulty plug in it. So uh, they can certainly, that one's just 14, and they can certainly learn how to do those things if you'll help them. And if you don't know how, look up the instructions on YouTube. Now that we have YouTube, oh my goodness, you can learn how to do any of those household tasks just by looking up a a video and watching it with your kids and providing the tools and, and just a little bit of supervision. Now you need to remember that teaching a child to do any chore will likely take more time than just doing doing the chore yourself, at least initially. Some kids will need more supervision than others over a longer period of time before they can complete the chore up to standard. Honestly, that's probably why some parents don't even bother trying. But the effort is so worth it in the end. So let's follow Paul's advice in Galatians 6, 9, and let us not become weary in doing good for At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We should also do our best to be an encourager rather than a drill sergeant if we want our kids to do their work heartily and well. I have some fun and creative suggestions for getting kids to do their chores cheerfully, but I think I'm going to need to save that topic for another podcast. In the meantime, I'll put a link in the show notes today to a blog post on getting your kids to do their chores cheerfully. The point is, if you want your kids to develop a strong work ethic and learn time management skills and be better prepared for life than assign regular chores. Have them make their beds and put away their toys, keep their room tidy, clear dinner dishes, and help fold the laundry. Set a good example for them as to how to do everything without complaining or arguing, as we're told in Philippians 2, 14 to do, and then work alongside them knee to knee and shoulder to shoulder and train them to be a team player by doing their assigned chores competently, consistently, and cheerfully. Such traits will lay a foundation for future success regardless what field of study, regardless what field of work they ultimately pursue. Thanks so much for listening today. If you have a question you'd like to hear covered on this podcast, message me on Instagram at Flanders underscore family or contact me through my website, lovinglifeathome.com. Before you go, if you've been encouraged by something you've heard on the show, do me a favor and forward the link to a friend or head over to Loving Life at Home on Apple iTunes to subscribe and leave a written review of the show. Your doing so will help others find me so they can listen too. Until next time, I pray the Lord will bless your efforts to build a loving home life centered on Him.